if they want an official apology, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I apologize for any wrongdoings or any black eyes I've brought onto the sport. I love the sport. And that's why I've come back to run and try to run to best of my abilities. And for that, you know, I, I, I've worked hard to right my wrongs. What's up guys, Derek from PlaySmartAce.com. Today we're gonna to be going over Justin Gatlin's steroid cycle. So this is what he got popped for back in almost 15 years ago now. Um, but in particular, his choice of compounds, we already know what he tested positive for, but this video is going to delve into exactly why he chose the compound he did for 100 meter sprinting and the sort of logic that goes into PED choices when it comes to Olympic competitive events, specifically 100 meter sprinting for this video. So the choice of certain compounds is something that is often neglected. I should say the intelligent choice of compounds is something that is neglected often by individuals who are getting into bodybuilding or performance enhancement in general and sports and just think that gear is gear and they all do that. It all does the same thing. They don't know the differences between different families of compounds, the effects they have on protein expression, nitrogen retention, glucocorticoid receptor antagonism, neurology, production of red blood cell count. There's so many things to consider when it comes to intelligent choice of compounds, but when it comes to Olympic sports and testing too, there's a whole nother layer that's added onto that. And that is what can you use that you will get away with. So this video in particular is going to focus on hundred meter sprinting. So as you've probably seen over the years, there's been many sprinters that have gotten busted. Some of them uh, had their titles even revoked after getting busted. Famously, Ben Johnson, first denozolol and in this video we're gonna be talking about justin gatlin so he tested positive for testosterone now the reason i want to get into this case specifically is not necessarily why testosterone would be good for a sprinter because at the end of the day the reason he used testosterone wasn't necessarily because it's the ideal compound choice however it's what he thought he could get away with in my opinion and that's sort of what i'm going to delve into why that was the case and how many sprinters circumvented the testing by using testosterone so the test on Gatlin was called the carbon isotope ratio test. And it is essentially a test that looks only at testosterone, not epitestosterone, which is, you know, what is seen as the ratio of testosterone to epitestosterone is the first thing that's usually looked at by WADA and can determine whether the testosterone in a person's system is natural or unnatural is what is the goal of the carbon isotope ratio test. So Gatlin in the past had tested positive for substance and Adderall in college. He claims it was for ADD. He served a two-year ban for that. And another ban could have got him a lifetime ban at the time. And in 2006, he did test a positive for testosterone. So before we get into why exactly he would have done this and why he didn't use another, you know, short acting steroid or why he did what he did, you have to understand epitestosterone is endogenously produced too and it's also something that can act on ar it's a potent 5 alpha reductase inhibitor as well apparently but how it is formed in the body typically it's found in a ratio a specific ratio of testosterone to epitestosterone and it's used as a detection method in doping and the reason is this ratio is very consistent among athletes and it is extremely uncommon for anybody who is natural to have a testosterone to epitestosterone ratio that goes out of the spectrum of this test, essentially. So basically, it started at most people, most healthy males exhibit a ratio of one to one. However, there were some studies that were conducted to find the mean among athletes of what the standard testosterone to epitestosterone ratio is, and it was closer to 1.15 to 1 in Australian athletes. Another study found that the maximum ratio for the 95th percentile of athletes was 3.71 to 1, and the max ratio found for the 99th percentile was 5.25 to 1, and the original cutoff was 8 to 1 which is an extremely lenient ratio and allows a lot of leeway for performance enhancement. And it was eventually dropped down to six to one. And then now to the present one of four to one. So this is still pretty generous. I'm going to explain why soon. So 
certain individuals are going to have naturally high ratios. Some are going to have low. This is largely dependent on genetic polymorphisms as well as hepatic metabolism of sex hormones and certain things like that. But Basically, if a urinary testosterone to epitestosterone ratio is suspicious for doping, that is typically the only time WADA will then pursue actually trying to find out if that person's been using something specifically by using a carbon isotope ratio test. So given a lot of opportunity and leeway here to not fuck up essentially. So this first urine test that they use to detect metabolites of synthetic compounds is obviously you either have to choose something that's so short acting it's out of your system soon enough and that is typically something that can be calculated with relative ease based on your metabolism as well as knowing what five active half-lives would be of the compound in question but above and beyond that if you have random testing you don't know when the tests are you can't prepare for a clearance of a certain compound you then have to get into the realm of bioidentical hormone use to try and circumvent the test should it have been conducted while you have the hormone still in your system assuming you don't know when the test is so i think gatlin i actually didn't see the details on this because this story sort of been buried over the years but gatlin to me, it sounds like he probably failed the testosterone to epitestosterone ratio and then subsequently had the carbon isotope ratio test, which then confirmed his use. But circumventing the initial gauge of that ratio to make sure you're under four to one, first of all, the four to one ratio is extremely generous. As I mentioned, even the 99th percentile of athletes are only going to exceed that essentially. And that's like of the most significant outliers. And above and beyond that is when, you know, subsequent testing would be done and so that initial urine test is also going to be as mentioned detecting things like you know synthetic anabolics like stenozole metabolites of it and other compounds that might be leveraged to enhance performance and these are a lot more easy to detect because they're not synthesized endogenously your body doesn't make stenozole it doesn't make um, halo it doesn't make master on while they are derivatives of testosterone they're a lot easier to pick up in a urine test where you actually have a target of what you're looking for as opposed to testosterone and epitestosterone where your body endogenously synthesizes these things so even if it's picked up in a urine test it has to be suspicious looking for them to delve further because the hormone is going to show as testosterone which is something that you're supposed to naturally produce anyways so now the reason the ratio though is filled with issues is that the ratio has tons of leeway, especially for those who have lower ratios endogenously through their own genetics. So a study was conducted using testosterone and anthate to see if athletes could beat the testosterone to epitestosterone ratio cutoff of four to one while using exogenous anabolics, or I should say exogenous testosterone specifically. So basically what they assessed was 16 healthy young men. And there's been other things to evaluate this as well. This isn't, this isn't the only study that did this, but this one is very interesting in particular because they use 3.5 milligrams per kilogram, which is a lot of gear. Imagine somebody who is a Olympic sprinter, probably like 90 kilogram male or 85, 90 kilograms. I don't know off the top of my head, but you know, really lean guys with a significant amount of lean body mass, 3.5 milligrams per kilogram. You could be looking at like 250, 300 milligrams a gear per week, which is way more than you naturally produce and has significant performance enhancing outcomes. And in this test, they were evaluating if it could increase muscular strength and cycle sprint performance in three to six weeks. And if the WADA imposed urinary tes testosterone to epitestosterone ratio of four to one could identify all subjects being administered 3.5 milligrams per kilogram. And they used 16 healthy young men were match paired in this study and assigned randomly in a double blind manner to achieve testosterone or placebo. One rep max strength measures and 10 second cycle sprint performance were monitored at the pre, mid, and post time points of three and six weeks. Body mass and testosterone to epitestosterone ratio were measured at pre and post time points. When compared with baseline, one rep max bench press strength and total work during the cycle sprint increased significantly at week three, as you'd expect, and week six in the testosterone and anthate group, but not in placebo group. Go figure. Body mass at week six was significantly greater than at baseline in the testosterone group. Go figure, but not in the placebo group. Despite the clear ergogenic effects of testosterone and anthate in as little as three weeks, four of the nine subjects in the testosterone and anthate group, so almost 50% of them, did not test positive to testosterone under the current 
water urinary testosterone and epi testosterone ratio criteria. So you can see how somebody who, especially somebody who has an idea of when they're getting tested and has an idea on the pharmacokinetics of what they're using, if you knew when the tests were, first of all, I don't know how random they were back in 2000 and early 2000s when Gatlin was tested, you'd have to be pretty damn dumb to not evaluate the pharmacokinetics of whatever exogenous anabolics you could be using or the testosterone clearance that you'd be using too to make sure you fall within that cutoff and even if you do fall outside that cutoff that's when the carbon isotope ratio test then gets conducted and then at that point you would pretty much be fucked unless you had a animal derived version of testosterone that was reacted down from animal based cholesterol or something like that but that is chemistry above and beyond what gatlin had access to clearly or just was not exactly developed yet because he did end up tripping it and getting testing positive once he got to the carbon isotope ratio test. But the point is you should never get to the carbon isotope ratio test to begin with because you shouldn't be tripping that cutoff. You should either be clearing a short acting anabolic out of your system fast enough by properly assessing its pharmacokinetic profile, or you should be ensuring that you have enough clearance or you're within that testosterone to epitestosterone ratio cutoff as well to never even put yourself in a position where where you would then essentially invite WADA to test you further. Because it's not like, as far as I'm concerned, based on what I've seen, they don't want you to test positive. Everything is put in place for it to seem to the public that you are being tested scrupulously and everything is like super, you know, scientific and intense. But in reality, the way they're setting it up is we're giving you a very easy test to pass with very basic parameters with limited detection ability. And we're only going to test you further to confirm findings if we get a suspicious test result on the really shitty version with holes in it. So by, you know, like every single sprinter is obviously juicing. It's not like Gatlin is the only one. Every single one's doing the same thing. And he's just the one who didn't, you know, be careful enough. All he had to do was stay within that ratio and he would have been fine. He would have not got the carbon isotope ratio test. And then once you do trip that limit, your baby water is like, oh shit, well now we got to test everything. Now we got to go do the full blown thing. You're fucked now. That's pretty much the extent of it. So like there's so much data that is just buried or just no one really knows about showing that literally you can clear this WADA test just by understanding clearance rates and understanding how bioidentical hormone ratios work. And Gatlin is just another case of not taking that into consideration and preparing himself for the tests. And as a consequence, he paid the price and it's unfortunate for him. And reality, it's not like he should really be frowned on because everyone's doing the same thing. It's just unfortunate that he didn't have the foresight to see, I don't know, plan his uh, drug stack properly like the other athletes he was competing against because the leeway on this ratio is pretty significant realistically so to me the most baffling thing and the thing that really you know drives it home at the end of the day is if you understand how hormones work you would know that when you take an exogenous source of anabolic androgenic steroids what is something that is a hundred percent notable in every single person is the negative feedback that occurs with the HPTA and the suppression of luteinizing and follicle stimulating hormone. So instead of testing a testosterone to epitestosterone ratio with an extremely huge amount of leeway to the point that you could be using upwards of 300 milligrams of tests per week and not even tripping the ratio, not even accounting for all the other synthetic anabolics you could be using if you understood their pharmacokinetics good enough to clear in time for a test, you could just test all these people for luteinizing and follicle stimulating hormone and see who's suppressed or not. But instead, they use this super complicated scientific method to make the public think that they're doing all all this stuff when in reality they're just giving a loophole in order for you to essentially plan your stack better to get around the tests so like to me if i was trying to catch somebody who was using growth hormone or was using exogenous anabolics i'd be like okay let's go blood test igf1 levels let's see your luteinizing hormone let's see your follicle stimulating hormone and then that'd be it i'd be catching 99 percent of people and then any anybody above and beyond that that's doing trickery with serms or anything like that i just look at their urinary metabolites then at that point for all those compounds and it's the exact same thing so like they're not trying to get these people is the interesting and funny enough like extremely overlooked thing that's kind of hilarious at the end of the day but i want to explain it because it is uh something that i feel is very interesting it doesn't really get talked about much so hopefully you guys enjoyed that explanation a bit of a you know deep dive on olympic athletes and peds so 
Hope you guys enjoyed it. Please like, comment, helps the algorithm. Really appreciate when you guys do that. I highly recommend you sign up for the newsletter too. First link in the description below if you want to get notified whenever I publish articles that deep dives into the applications, practical application, as well as uh, you know health optimization and management in regards to in the context of pharmacology, bodybuilding, performance enhancement in general, um, I highly recommend you sign up for the newsletter because you won't get sent my articles unless you sign up for that. So a lot of incentive to do that there. You can also check all the clinical studies I reference in those articles that you will not get access to otherwise. Follow me on Instagram, at moreplates underscore more dates, Facebook, Snapchat, BitChute, Twitter, TikTok, Apple Podcasts. If you uh, want to support the channel, check out my turnkey nootropic formulas and pre-workout formulas in the video description below, gorillamode.com, gorillamind.com. Uh, just check the current label of your pre-workout, compare it to mine, and I guarantee you'll see pretty quickly why ours is gaining steam in this industry as one of the industry leaders with the most potent formulas designed by me personally with what I use and mix up myself prior to even before I had a company. This is the kind of dosages and combinations I would be using myself as a consumer. So thank you guys for watching. Talk to you soon.